Okay, chapter 8 in the screw tape letters. Wormwood had great hopes that his patient was getting past his religious phase. And screw tape is disappointed with his lack of knowledge of God's way of working. And this is what screw tape says to Wormwood Do you not know the law of undulation? He says, You have not studied properly in your in your demon school. You do not understand the law of undulation. The humans are hybrids, he said. They're half animals and half spirit. As spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirits can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies and their passions and imaginations are in continual change. For to be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy is therefore undulation, a series of troughs and peaks. This undulation is observed in all departments of their life, in work and affections for his, their friends, in their physical appetites. All go up and down. So uh, Screwtape is teaching his nephew that he should not to get too excited because his patient has gone down a little bit and is becoming sad and not as spiritual active anymore because this is normal for human beings. The closest thing to constancy they have is uh, a series of troughs and peaks. So any, in anyone's life, there, there are ups and downs, and so he should not put too much store in these. The dryness and the dullness your patient is experiencing is not your workmanship, but merely a natural phenomenon which will do us no good unless you make good use of it. In order to make good use of the, this time, you must think about what God wants to teach that patient through this low time and do the exact opposite. So just the fact that life has its up and down is something important for Christians to understand. Um, and it's, it's just um, important for us to understand so that when we are in these low times, we will know that these low times will not last forever, that there will be high times that are coming. This is exactly what Ecclesiastes 3 teaches us about being there being a time for everything. Listen to what King Solomon says. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time of peace. What do workers gain from the toil? I have seen the burden God laid on human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human hearts. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. It's very important us for un to understand that there is a time for everything. And that will help us to deal with that time as it comes. There's nothing we can do to change that time when it comes. And we just need to get through it. And we just need to get through it, hopefully, by learning what God wants to teach us during that time. Screwtape further tells Wormwood that God actually relies more on the down times than he does on the high times to change, to change people and draw them closer to him. Some of his favorites, God's favorites, had gone through deeper and longer troughs than anyone else. And then he explains, we aim to absorb the will of the patient into ours and to make him a servant. But God demands another type of obedience. God truly loves mankind and he truly wants freedom for them. He really does want them to become like him in all ways, but by their own will. He does not want them to be like him because he has forced them to be like him, but he wants them to freely conform to his will. We want servants and cattle. God wants servants who can finally become sons. God wants a world full of beings united to him, but still distinct from him. So what he's saying is, is God wants human beings to stay themselves 
and who he created them to be, and all the while to submit to his desires and do his will out of their own choice. He does not want to make a puppet. He does not want them to be robots. He wants them to be distinct beings that choose to do his will out of love for him, whereas Satan just wants submitment. Galatians 4, 1-7 what I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elementary spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. You see, here Paul explains th that a son is no different than a slave at first. That he has to learn the, his father's work before he can become a real son or become a, a co-worker with his father. Therefore, us Christians also, we were under law first. The law had to teach us humility and had to teach us uh, what God required. And later, God sent His Son to give us grace so that we could become His Son and that we can be co-heirs with Him. Hebrews 12.1 No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You see, God uses, as Screwtape says, the troughs, the lows, and the highs in our life to, to teach us. And this is painful at the time, but if we are willing to learn, if we choose to learn from it, this produces righteousness and peace in our lives. And therefore, we can start doing God's will by our own desire, through His strength, and still remain ourselves. Screwtape says to his nephew, You must have wondered why the enemy does not use more of his power to make himself known to humans in a more tangible way. You now understand that God cannot use the two weapons we know as irresistible and indisputable to merely override a human's will by his presence. This would be useless to him. God wants them to be one with him and yet themselves. He does not want to cancel them out. He says God does not show himself to humans in an irresistible way, an indisputable way, so that he completely over overrides their desires and their will. Because if he did this, they would no longer be themselves and they would be become a puppet to him because he is so powerful and wonderful. He, he further goes on and says, At the beginning, of course, he is prepared to do a little overriding to initially draw them to himself. But he never allows this state to last long. Sooner or later, he withdraws from their conscious experience. He leaves them to stand up on their own to carry on with their duties without his direct intervention. It is then that they go through hard times, and yet it is then they grow to be more like him and truly change their will. At first, when a, a, per, a person first becomes a Christian, he does override in a way. He comes in and he shows himself in such a way that it is indisputable. But then he withdraws himself so that they can make a choice to choose to follow him or not. He never completely overrides their freedom because he wants them to choose to follow him and not be forced to follow him. And this is why he allows them to go through ups and downs in their life. And it is through the ups and downs that they grow to love him more and serve him more and become more like him by their own choice. We see an example of this in, in Scripture in the conversion of Lydia in Acts 16, 13-14. On a Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to, to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. 
we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. See, God opened the heart of Lydia in order that she can respond. It is her that is responding. He's not overriding her desire and her will, but he is showing himself to an extent that she can respond because we know that no one will seek God unless he shows himself to them. No one will turn to God. No one seeks God. And therefore, God must come into someone's life through the through the gospel and through the work of missionaries. And he must override the person to the extent that they can make a choice. If he didn't do this, no one would ever make a choice for them. So there is there is a game here being played where he comes in and he shows himself and then and then people can respond. But once people respond, God does not come and take complete control over someone's life and does everything for them because then he he'd be playing puppets and that's why there's so much sin in our lives. The Holy Spirit doesn't come uh, to the point where he takes complete control of us and we become angels and, and we do everything right. There is our part to play. We, keep, we need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. There is our part because he never wants to completely override our desires. He wants us to become sons. He does not want us to become robots or puppets. And, and this, is, uh, this is what Screwtape is explaining to Wormwood. God wants them to learn to walk, and therefore he must remove his hands from them. And if the will to walk is there, he is happy with their stumbling. God is making sons out of children, and he wants them to walk on their own. And in order to do this, he has to remove his hand from them. And when he does remove his hand, they will stumble, they will fall. But what uh, Screwtape is saying here is that he's happy when there is a will to walk. That is already something that makes God happy. And he's even happy when they stumble as long as they get back up and keep on trying to walk. And this is according to his desire. Second Peter 1, 5 to 8 For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from be being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have come back to this verse again and again. And we see that we are to add, of course, with the help of the Holy Spirit, but He does not override our, our will to just give us that and hand it to us without our desiring it and with us, without us trying to get it. So it is our job to add to our faith goodness and knowledge and to keep on growing, and that will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God uses these ups and downs in our lives to draw us closer to Him. And this is how Screwtape ends this chapter. This is why God loves the prayers that are offered to Him during the states of dryness. It is very dangerous when a human is going through a dry spell, no longer wanting to continue, no longer seeing God's presence, and yet continuing to obey. He's saying it's very dangerous when a Christian is in that state where he is uh, in a way hopeless and doesn't see God's hand working and, and God's not holding him, or, and it's not a, a time of peace and joy, but yet he continues on within his faith in obedience. And, and this is very valuable. It is, it is life-changing for the human being, and it draws him in the end closer to God. And obviously this is not what Satan wants.